Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I want to discuss tensor product spaces. This is another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. In introductory quantum mechanical courses, we typically concentrate in simple systems with one degree of freedom. This is in order to simplify the maths. What this means in practice is that we have a single particle moving in one dimension. But of course we want to be able to describe more interesting problems that require three dimensions and more than one particle. This is precisely where tensor product state spaces come in. They are state spaces that allow us to describe these more interesting problems by using the simpler state spaces as building blocks. As an example, consider a first particle described in a state space with dissociated bases, operators and so on. Then imagine a second particle with a dissociated mathematical construction. Now imagine that our system has both particles in it. In this case, how is the state space of the combined system related to the individual state spaces of the two individual particles? The answer relies on a mathematical formalism known as the tensor product of vector spaces, and this is what we'll cover today. So let's go! We write the tensor product space V of the two spaces V1 and V2 like this, where we use this symbol here to represent a tensor product. The state space V is a tensor product space if for every pair of states Psi in V1 and Phi in V2 there is a corresponding state in V which we denote by the tensor product of Psi1 with Phi2. In this expression we're labeling each ket with a subindex that indicates to which of the original state spaces the ket belongs to. In this notation the order in which the terms are written in the tensor product doesn't really matter because the subindex already identifies which state space they belong to. With this notation, then we say that V is a tensor product space if it obeys the following properties. The first is that the tensor product of two vectors needs to be linear with respect to scalar multiplication. What this means is that when we multiply A times the tensor product of Psi with Phi, this is equal to the tensor product of A Psi with Phi, which is also equal to the tensor product of Psi with A Phi, and in all these expressions A is a scalar. The second property is that it is distributive with respect to vector addition. What this means is that the tensor product between Psi1 plus Psi2 with Phi is equal to the tensor product of Psi1 with Phi plus the tensor product of Psi2 with Phi. We of course have a similar expression when the addition is between states in V2 like this. In this notation, note that the subindex outside the ket is telling us to which of the original state spaces the ket belongs to, just like above, and the subindex of the label of the ket allows us to identify the specific ket. You should make sure that you understand the role of each subindex, because moving on it is very important to be able to confidently manipulate expressions in tensor product state spaces. Now that we have defined the tensor product space, we need to understand how to use it. Let's start with basis states. We consider a basis U of state space V1 that has dimension N1, and the basis V of state space V2 that has dimension N2. It then follows that the set of states formed by the tensor products of U and V basis states form a basis in the tensor product state space V. If we count all possible combinations of U and V basis states, we see that the dimension of V is N1 times N2. Again, note that these subindices here are telling us to which of the two original state spaces the cats belong to, and the subindices here allow us to distinguish individual cats within a given state space. To see how we can use the basis state, let's consider general state Psi Phi in V. The state Psi, which lives in V1, can be expanded in the U basis like this. The state Phi, which lives in V2, can be expanded in the V basis like this. If we then build a tensor product between Psi and Phi, we can substitute in the corresponding expansions to obtain this expression here. If we use linearity with respect to scalar multiplication, we can move the sums and expansion coefficients to the beginning, and we obtain this expression here. So what is this telling us? The expansion coefficients of a tensor product state are obtained by multiplying the components of the two states in the tensor product. What this also means though is that in a sense these states are trivial. All we need to describe the states in the tensor product space V is to actually describe them in the smaller spaces V1 and V2 and then that fully specifies the combined state. Although this result is rather important, quantum mechanics is much more interesting than this. To see why, consider another ket chi in V. We can always write chi as equal to the sum over ij of some expansion coefficients aij and the basis states of V, which are given by the tensor product of the basis states in V1 and V2. Now let's ask the question, can we always write this chi as being built by two states that were originally only specified in V1 and V2? 
To be able to do that, we should be able to write aij as equal to ci times dj. But is this always possible? This is where quantum mechanics gets exciting, because the answer, in fact, is no. To understand why, it's actually enough to consider a counterexample. Imagine that v1 and v2 are both two-dimensional state spaces. What that means is that then v is a four-dimensional state space. A general state psi in v1 is given by these two terms. A general state phi in v2 is given by these two terms. And the general state chi in v is given by these four terms. Now, what does a state in v built from psi and phi look like? As we just saw, it is given by these four terms. So the question becomes, can we find c1 and c2 and d1 and d2 such that c1 d1 is equal to a11, c1 d2 is equal to a12, c2 d1 is equal to a21, and c2 d2 is equal to a22? We can rewrite these as a set of equations, a11 equals c1 d1, a12 equals c1 d2, and so on. And now the question becomes whether it is possible to solve this set of equations simultaneously. Here's a very simple counterexample. Consider a chi given by this expression. Here we have a11 equal to 1 over square root of 2, a12 equal to 0, a21 also equal to 0, and a22 equal to minus 1 over square root of 2. If we now look at this equation, then the second relation here implies that c1 is equal to 0, or d2 is equal to 0. In turn, this would imply that either a11 is 0 because it is proportional to c1, or a22 is 0 because it is proportional to d2. But if we check state chi, we see that a11 and a22 are not 0. So in fact, there is no possible solution to this set of equations for this state chi. Even this very simple state is an example of a state in V that cannot be written as a combination of two states coming from V1 and V2. States like these are called entangled states, and they play a major role in many of the most exotic properties of quantum mechanics. In fact, Schrodinger, who was the person who coined the term entangled states, described them as not one, but rather the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics. So you can imagine the important scope of this result. But before we get too excited about entangled states, we should go back to the topic of this video, which is the mathematical formalism behind tensor product state spaces. If you want to learn more about entangled states, check out the videos in the description. The next quantity I want to look at is the scalar product between two tensor product states. Let's consider two kets psi and psi prime in v1, and two kets phi and phi prime in v2. Let's also build the tensor product states between psi and phi, and between psi prime and phi prime, both of which belong to v. We then write the scalar product between the tensor product states like this, and we define it as equal to the scalar product between psi and psi prime in v1, multiplied by the scalar product between phi and phi prime in v2. So what this means is that the scalar product is pretty straightforward. All we need to do is to group the states according to which state space they belong to. To see an example of how this works, let's consider basis states. We built an orthonormal basis u in v1, and another orthonormal basis v in v2. Is the basis uv in the tensor product state space v then also orthonormal? If we calculate the scalar product, then we obtain the scalar product between the u states, multiplied by the scalar product between the v states. And as these are individually orthonormal, then we obtain this. What this means is that the basis of the tensor product state space is also orthonormal. Now that we know how kets from two different state spaces combine in the tensor product space, a natural question is to ask what happens to operators. Let's start with an operator A1 that acts on V1, and the second operator B2 that acts on V2. We define the tensor product between A1 and B2, by its action on states in the tensor product space. This gives us the tensor product between a1 psi and b2 phi. So what does this mean? In the tensor product, the a1 operator acts on the part of the state associated with v1, and the b2 operator acts on the part of the state associated with v2. If we remember the discussion on entangled states, we actually know that not all the states in v can be written as tensor products of states in v1 and v2. So we also need to understand how the tensor product between operators acts on the most general states that we can write down in v. To see this, consider a general ket chi, written in the uv basis, and as we have seen, it may or may not be given as the tensor product of two states from v1 and v2. We now consider the action of the tensor product on chi. 
we start by writing out chi in the UV basis. Then, because we're working with linear operators, we can move the operator inside the sum. And looking at how the tensor product of operators acts up here, we can write this as the sum over ij of the expansion coefficient aij, and then the tensor product between a1u and b2v. And in this way, we can also build the action of the tensor product a1b2 on general cats in v. Moving on, a very common family of operators that we encounter when we work with tensor product spaces are operators that only act on one of the individual spaces making up the full state space. For example, consider A1 acting on V1. How does A1 now act in the tensor product space V? From the discussion we just had, we can write it as the tensor product of A1 with the identity operator in V2. Indeed, acting with this operator on a tensor product basis state, then gives us the action of A1 on the part of the state in V1 and the action of the identity on the part of the state in V2. This simply gives this final expression in which the part of the state in V2 is left untouched. Of course, we can do the same with an operator B2 that originally acts on V2 and then we promote it to this when it acts on V. The final thing I want to discuss before wrapping up are the different types of notation that are used for tensor product spaces in physics. Let's start with the state, which is the tensor product between Psi1 and Phi2. This is many times simplified to this, where the tensor product symbol is simply omitted. Another big simplification that is made very often is to omit the subindices that indicate in which of the original state spaces the cats belong to. In this case, it is understood that the order in which you write the cats reflects which state space they come from. Yet another simplification is to write it like this. And again, in this case, the order becomes very important, and we understand that the first entry is associated with state space V1, and the second entry is associated with state space V2. To give you an example, we can see the three state spaces, those associated with the X, Y, and Z spatial dimensions. We then build the tensor product space V as this tensor product. Gets in V are written like this. However, they are very often written like this or this, or this, or even this. Whenever you see any of these other forms, you need to remember that this cat is really the result of a tensor product. So what about operators? We typically write the tensor product between A1 and B2 as simply A1, B2. In this language, the tensor product between A1 and the identity in V2 can be written like this, and this in turn is often written like this. In this last expression, we have lost all reference to the fact that A1 really acts on the tensor product space V, but it should always be clear from the context which state space an operator like A1 acts on. As an example, consider two free particles moving in one dimension. Their Hamiltonian, which is the operator associated with the energy, is given by the sum of the individual kinetic energies. In reality, you will most often see it written like this, but you need to remember what this really means. We have learned that we can use tensor product state spaces to study systems that have more than one degree of freedom. As you can imagine, tensor product state spaces appear all the time in quantum mechanics, and examples include particles in three dimensions, particles that have orbital and spin degrees of freedom, or systems that have more than one particle. As an example to see tensor product state spaces in action, check out the videos on systems of identical quantum particles. If you like the video, or you would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.